All right, next up on our agenda, we have our second town hall of the workshop on flight software frameworks, moderated by our 2022 flight software workshop technical chair, Chris Eastand. Chris, it is all yours. Um, so for, for those of you that were here on Tuesday, this is gonna be a similar discussion uh, where we're going to pull in some experts in the field representing different uh, uh, flight software frameworks that, that are being used all across the globe. And um, so as we go through, we'll do a quick introduction uh, and then open it up for questions. Uh, so uh, next slide. First person up is Christoph Hanvo. Yes, good afternoon. So I don't see my video is working. Uh, so I'm Christophe Hanvo. I'm the head of the software technology section at uh, ISA STEC. And um, this section is evaluating the technologies that are, can be used to improve the way the flight software is developed. So we are covering all the aspects of the flight the software development process. So starting from requirement engineering and uh, the flow down of this requirement into software. For the development of software, we are aiming at ensuring a seamless process from the system to the uh, embedded uh, flight software. And this is what is illustrated in the bottom left, where we have a generic uh, requirement specifications that are tailored by projects used for uh, system modeling and then uh, later flow down into software modeling tools that are able to uh, ensure a seamless integration of the different modules and a deployment on the hardware we are using. So in this example, it is a GR740 and a Brave Medium FPGA, for instance. And the tools uh, chain is able to generate all the glue code that uh, is used to integrate the software modules. And this rely also on uh, building blocks uh, that are illustrated on the right. Uh, for what concerns the execution platform with the TSB based runtime uh, systems we are uh, relying, like uh, Isratum or PyQOS, or classical runtime with a qualified uh, version of Airtem's uh, SMP. And for the execution platform, we are, uh, let's say, de developing or supporting the development of all the standard libraries, like mathematical library, uh, 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 OBCP engine, which are uh, virtual machines, and so on. Thank you, Krista. Uh, next up is Amalaye uh, Ayake. Hello, uh, good morning and good afternoon in uh, some places. Uh, my name is Amalaye Ayake, and I'm a flight software engineer at Blue Origin. Um, I spent uh, many years at NASA JPL, and I see a lot of my uh, JPL friends here. And uh, I'm also, I was also very involved in with the Flight Software Workshop at its uh, creation and also the, uh, the SMACIT, uh, IEEE SMACIT committee. And I will be uh, speaking a little bit about, or answering questions a little bit about Space Ross and I think an issue that's a little bit dear to my heart, which is sort of automating the, the software qualification process as well. Um, and I will also share that uh, a lot of my background is in middleware. Um, so messaging, um, particularly messaging across uh, very long distances, space uh, distance, distances. Um, I was involved with the, uh, the space internet uh, technical demonstration uh, in 2008, where we were uh, basically turning a spacecraft into a router 25 million miles away. So that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Up next is Jake Hageman. Hello, yeah. Can you hear me? I don't see my video, but um, I'm Jake Hageman. Uh, the I was the CFS framework product development lead for the last three years. So that's the Aquila, Buotes, Calum, and now Draco development uh, cycles. And uh, I've recently transitioned to a senior flight software engineer position. 
uh, still very involved with uh, CFS, but a little bit broader scope than just the framework these days. Um, I think most people know uh, in this context about CFS, but uh, open sourced in about 2015 is when we really started going open source um, and came from satellite CNDH and uh, command and data handling systems and attitude determination and control systems. Uh, over years, they realized, you know, they were just inheriting software over and over again, tweaking it each time. Um, we realized we could abstract that out and really uh, use more of a common approach and just build apps on top of it. So just part of a part of the big team, one of the faces on, on GitHub. Um, if CFS ever broke for you, it was probably partially my fault. Any fixes I attribute to the rest of the team. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, up next, Tim Canham. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Tim Canham from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, I've been on a number of projects over the years. I started my career in the Deep Space Network, for those of you who are familiar with that. And uh, just to, you know, give a clue, that's me with a blue arrow. Um, I'm sure by looking at that picture, you could tell it's obviously me, but that was that was from a day we were in the space flight assembly building at JPL testing the helicopter and and uh, they let us take a picture next to the Perseverance rover. So that was kind of a cool picture. But going back to my what I was saying before, I started in the Deep Space Network writing uh, embedded software for controlling the antennas and the, and the transmitters and receivers for the Deep Space Network. So I spent a good chunk of my young career out on the Deep Space Network climbing antennas, installing equipment, and testing. I spent a good time on Cassini the spacecraft that went to Saturn. Uh, I worked on the really the simulation side. We built a big instruction level simulator so they could run the uh, flight software right on our simulator. You could think of it as a proto QEMU or if you want or however you pronounce the, the acronym, but it was a, they could just take the uh, flight co software code and run it directly there. And then I think my big break into the flight software world was I spent about seven years on the Curiosity rover project as a flight software engineer. Uh, I got in very early and did a lot of the infrastructure works. And a lot of that code has come forward into the Perseverance rover too. They inherited a lot of code from, from Curiosity. So my code is still running on Perseverance and Curiosity. And I think I really got a good deep introduction to, to flight software there. And finally, most recently, uh, I was the flight software lead for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter, which is currently in operations on the surface. I gave a little talk about that yesterday. And once I, we, we completed, our team completed the software delivery, then I really transitioned to uh, operations because that's how we operated. It was via the software. So we came up with a set of tools and processes and, and you know, formed interactions with the Perseverance team to make sure that we operated the helicopter correctly. I am also the architect of F Prime. Back in 2013 and 2014, we did we, we developed the early beginnings of F Prime as part of a technology development task at JPL, and uh, we have a group at JPL who does a lot of these F Prime projects in a number of different locations. And as Amalia mentioned, he was one of the first early adopters of F Prime on his project, so I count him as one of my uh, F Prime comrades, if you will. And uh, it's it's growing and we're learning and, and making improvements to F prime as a framework and it's now open source. I mentioned that again yesterday, it's open source on GitHub. And also one role that I played was that um, early on in MSL, I made the case that we should be switching to Linux. And we and uh, our project kind of turned, MSL turned away from the old Solaris implementation that the Mars exploration rovers had and and switch to Linux. And that in, in a way paved the way for the Mars helicopter to be actually flying Linux on Mars, which is kind of a cool story in itself. And I, actually the rover itself has Linux running on a instrument payload, the EDL cameras, for those of you who saw the amazing video landing videos, that was essentially a, an x86 Linux PC with USB cameras that they just turned on and said, just video the entire landing and we'll offload it later after the landing. It wasn't involved in the actual landing itself, but in terms of controlling it, but it was just like a giant DVR for the landing. So that's kind of a cool little um, mention of a role that I played early on in MSL. 
But you know, at this at this point in my career, I'm working on different technologies to, to move avionics and move software forward to JPL, and uh, we really believe that F prime is part of that. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Up next is Kevin Gordon. Yeah, can you hear me okay? All right, uh, Chris, thanks to you and the workshop for inviting me. Uh, definitely honored to be here with uh, these distinguished other panelists. Um, I'm not gonna read all the bullets here. I'll start kind of at the end. I'm representing Firefly Aerospace right now. I'm the director of a department called Aerospace Software Engineering, which covers uh, flight and ground software for both launch vehicles and uh, spacecraft. I do have a pretty uh, good breadth and depth of experience on just about every platform there is, particularly some advanced ones with uh, flight software. I, I, I do have a pretty good experience with CFE and CFS on a number of programs, including a interplanetary mission where I built a custom OSAL for a particular uh, operating system. A um, little bit familiar with F prime, don't really know what we're actually looking at it now, but the focus of my answers are gonna be in, in what you are interested in, Chris, and the panel is um, an architecture for a launch vehicle as opposed to a spacecraft. So I'll be uh, alluding to the, it's really not a, a, a framework in the sense of like F prime or CFS, but it'll be more like a description of architecture and a common way of doing things that I designed for the uh, Alpha launch vehicle where uh, we have uh, very distinct applications uh, running in their own virtual memory. Um, uh, one of these, for example, is a ground software interface that uh, talks to the ground software that Mike Cerna uh, described in an earlier presentation. And then yesterday, uh, Forrest Ward uh, did a presentation on GNC. GNC is one of the applications that runs in these frameworks. So um, that'll be my focus. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, next up, Peter Menden. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's great to be here today. So um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm the CEO and founder of Bright Ascension. And for those who don't know us, we are a small specialist based software company based in Scotland. And we have been working for just over 10 years um, in the space software area. We had our first mission launch in 2014. And uh, that's now being used in a wide range of satellites, mostly in the nano and small um, satellite classes. And over that period, we've developed a uh, component-based, model-based, and service-oriented technology that we call Generation One, and which we've applied to space software frameworks, both on the on the flight side and the ground side, um, across small and large-scale systems, from single satellites to constellations. And uh, as that applies to flight software, um, we have it as, as part of what we call our flight software development kit. Um, and that uh, is, a, is portable across a wide range of different hardware platforms and operating systems um, and has a very large libraries of software components that can be used on different um, ranges of hardware, uh, contains wide range of data handling functions and automation and communications protocols. So that's being used in a really wide range of applications from uh, technology demonstration, science, uh, earth observation, um, and uh, across customers who are based on all six continents. Uh, still got to get that Antarctican customer. And then uh, we also collaborate in uh, a wide range of, of R&D activities, including um, being able to work with a number of agencies such as the UK Space Agency and ESA. So thank you very much for having me here today. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I, I uh, have been around the workshop for a couple of days now, uh, but I'm Chris Easton. I'm the technical chair uh, for this year's Flight Software Workshop and moderator of this discussion. Um, so I previously have, uh, was the Flight Software Lead for uh, DART, uh, NASA DART out of uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Um, right now, I'm the flight software architect for Stokes Space Technologies, so trying to do reusable rockets. Um, I'm really, really excited for everybody here. Uh, I think 
one one of the the biggest takeaways that I'm hoping to get out of this is what what is your target um, and why? So we have a bunch of different frameworks that are answering a similar problem in different ways, um, and and I think that digging into some of the differences between what is the problem set that you're trying to hit and uh, what is either the target audience or the target hardware or the target environment. I think that really getting to understand all of those different pieces, uh, like what does Space Ross answer versus CFS? And when you go into distributed versus uh, a, a single board, how, how does that look? Um, so the goal over the next uh, 45 minutes is going to be kind of getting into those, those different pieces. Uh, please type your questions on, on the Zoom Q&A. Uh, and upvote, and I will uh, relay them to the panelists, and, and we'll go from there. Um, so I think that the, the question that I really want uh, to start with, though, is what, what, is your, what is your target? And whether that's an environment, whether that is uh, a, a platform, uh, or whether that is a, a group, um, and, and kind of talk through that. So can we start with Amalaye? Uh, yeah, I can uh, answer that. So our target is uh, robotic applications. If you look at uh, NASA roadmaps or future mission concepts, you will see a lot of robotic spacecraft and you'll also see uh, human spaceflight uh, in deep space or cislunar regions. And for a lot of these uh, mission concepts, you, you're going to need some sort of robotic function or requirement uh, to, to perform your activity, either whether it's in-space assembly or uh, a free-flying robot to man the cabin of, uh, of a, a vehicle that may not be occupied, um, a robot to explore the, the, uh, the caverns of, of a moon, such as Enceladus, those sorts of things. And if you look at the software development for these sorts of robotic systems, I think uh, agencies or corporations are left with a, a few choices. One is either to develop their software from scratch or to try to uh, develop an in-house software framework that they can reuse. And what Space Ross is trying to um, accomplish is really repeat the success of CFS in the robotic space so that uh, we can av avoid reinvention and we can build up a library of very uh, robust uh, software uh, tools that, that can be used for robotics. Very cool. Uh, Tim, can you, can you talk a bit about F Prime? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think our target audience has always been teams that want to quickly get a, a basic spacecraft up and running. Um, you know, the big flagship missions tend to have a clone and own multi, like five, 10 year schedule where they do lots of customizations to make sure that things work for their particular project. Um, so we haven't really been competing as much in that space, but where we've been competing a lot are these shorter duration, smaller schedule, smaller team approaches, like an instrument payload, uh, a CubeSat and, <clears throat> you know, a Mars helicopter. And you take a, you, the idea of F prime is that you have these set of reusable components that you can move from mission to mission. So you get basic C and DH functions that the premise is you take these and use these as your baseline and you try not to deviate from them. And then that'll give you the benefit of just being able to get up and running quickly and have a, have a project going. And uh, if you want to do massive customizations, well, maybe we're not the project for you. But if you want to have a shorter schedule and you want to get a spacecraft up and running reasonably quickly, we think F prime is a good option for that. And we were targeting embedded platforms. We have lots of embedded platforms all the way from a tiny uh, microcontroller all the way up to, you know, a full Linux workstation. If you ever wanted to, we used F prime as our own GSC architecture for a helicopter. We had another computer. We just instantiated F prime on there to do all these GSC functions because it was just simple to spin up. And you know, for that reason, we've made the code as portable as possible so that we can go on a bunch of different platforms, a bunch of different uh, operating systems. 
And even if you have no operating system, you can still run F prime. And so we've seen that bear out, at least in JPL, where we've had a number of smaller projects. You know, I, I point to what Amalia said in Rapid Scout. I believe they were they had about a nine month schedule. Amalia, you can correct me, but they had to get up very quickly to get on the ISS. And we've had Asteria, which is a CubeSat. We've had we have a, some other CubeSats ready to go, and they are all smaller teams. Uh, we've even been collaborating a lot with universities. There's a number of universities that are baselining F prime. Georgia Tech just launched a CubeSat off the ISS that is using F prime as their uh, software architecture. So I think that's really our our target audience is. Uh, projects that want to get up and running quickly with an established framework, an established set of components that they can reuse and then just build their mission logic on top of it. Stuff, can you can you talk a bit about the uh, ESIS framework? Yes. So actually, uh, as an agency, we cannot enforce uh, the use of a particular platform and we have prime uh, uh, or large scale integrators that are that have already have their uh, own platform. So uh, what we have done is to uh, let's say create some generic uh, requirement document, generic requirements related to the services uh, that uh, need to be provided by the platform. And we agreed between the different partners. And then uh, we ensure that uh, those uh, requirements are implemented correctly and are supported by a set of tools that are easing the integration of different components, even if they come from different providers. Uh, so the target audience is, of course, all the European uh, say industry who participated to the creation of these requirements. And uh, in terms of platform, we are also supporting, uh, let's say, at first, the main processors that are used in space, in, in European spacecraft that are uh, mostly the uh, GR740, 712 uh, processors. Uh, but also we uh, are supporting some um, microcontrollers for CubeSat. And uh, we are looking to uh, new space industries with the uh, Zinc platforms. Very cool. Um, can I get uh, Peter to, to talk a, a little bit about what Bright Ascension is is trying to target? Yeah, I can try. So I think probably the best way to talk about our target audience is uh, to talk about the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve for people um, through Generation 1. Um, and so um, as a, I mean, a little bit like F prime, um, as a component based platform, we are really looking to enable rapid development, um, at least rapid getting started. And so we've supported missions in the past with, with a, with a four month period for, uh, for flight software development. Um, that was, that was a set of comms missions, um, and they were very successful, um, but I suppose a key part of taking that component-based approach is about software reuse and, and managing that process well. And that's partly for, for getting people started by reusing software that already exists that someone else has given you. But it's also very much targeted at people who are looking beyond, say, a single spacecraft. So is that a constellation or is it a series of spacecraft or and managing change within uh, within. Uh, a mission in, in terms of uh, flight software updates and things like that. And the model-based aspect is related to that as well in that it's, it's about um, capturing the overall configuration and architecture of your system in a machine intelligible form. And that is partly about coordinating flight and ground. So a big emphasis for us is about getting the whole flight and ground system to work really, really well together. Um, and to be able to get the most out of that and managing change over time through things like software updates, changes in configuration of, of constellations and that sort of thing. And the service oriented aspect of what we do is really aimed at efficiency of operations. So back to trying to get the most out of your space system, whether that be for commercial or scientific objectives and managing 
heterogeneous systems. So as a, as a software organization that is not tied to any particular hardware, we, we are supporting a wide range of, of customers who are using the framework across different hardware platforms, different spacecraft vendors. Um, and so trying to provide a more uniform way of managing heterogeneity um, is an important aspect of the of the of the service oriented part of it. So I guess in terms of the target audience, we're um, we're trying to target people who think those things are important, um, and that really is, has been so far a, quite a diverse group of folk from university cubesat missions through to commercial constellations and 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 agency science missions. Very cool. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try and speed some things up. I know we really need to hear from, from at least from CFS. Uh, Jake, what, what is your target audience? <laughs> it originated, uh, you know, spacecraft, like I said, CDH, and uh, ADC kind of systems, but um, it definitely, uh, you know, if, if you look at the OSAL, um, that's kind of meant applicable anywhere where you need to abstract from the operating system level. And people have used it, you know, for, for so many different reasons, whether it's, you know, our tosses or if it's you want to develop on your Linux system and, and run from there. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that was one of the originators, I think, of, of really this um, layering that uh, CFE and CFS has really adapted and uh, taken advantage of. But it's, it's systems that need um, maintenance capabilities, you need configuration capabilities, ease of... Um, you know, changing parameters, that sort of thing, communication between systems. And um, really it's typically, you know, although you can run it without a file system in theory, I think people have done it. Um, it's, it's more meant for, or it's easier to use if you have an OS, if you have a file system, kind of these bigger systems. Um, but it has been used on, on quite a few instruments also. Uh, but it's, it's, it's ones where you, where you need more of these management um, sort, of, sort of capabilities not so much just a little a, a pipeline that has to push data really quickly. Um, that's, that's less a, its goal. Um, and we've been getting more into like multiple instances of CFS on, on systems where they have either different trust levels or different criticality. Um, and so it's the ease of communication in between these systems and how they're easy to control. If they all have the same set of commands, they're, they're just really, they play nice, right? And uh, you can transfer files and you can do all kinds of things between these systems almost for free. You just take the apps that do it and then you just customize what you need to. So. Oh. Um, hey, Chris, I would like to speak on this. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, clearly our target right now is a launch vehicle, Alpha. And the team, of course, being the aerospace software engineering team, but we have a big picture here that we're marching towards. And I think a lot of us have the same kind of end goals, even though we don't have open source right now, we have taken concrete steps with this framework and architecture to get to a more mature place like F prime is. I don't know if we'll be open source. I kind of doubt it, but we will certainly, and under the direction of Firefly be offering our ground and so flight software services uh, to other companies. Um, some of the steps that we've taken along that way are components or actually applications, pure applications, typically agnostic like GNNC that Forrest talked about yesterday, uh, can, we basically wrap it. So it has very clean interfaces. We do the same thing with the other eight components that we have in the flight software right now. So um, another step that we're taking towards that is configurability. We, we have 11, or 12 configuration files. So the flight software, we've been able to implement major functional changes with simple changes to text-based uh, configuration files. Um, another step that we're taking in the way is being OS agnostic. I'm pretty proud of announcing that uh, you, we got a couple of interns to build a lightweight uh, operating system abstraction layer for us. And in our hardware in the loop environment for alpha running on Red Hat on a laptop, we hit orbit on the first time with the identical flight software. So that, that, that shows that we're on the right path, um, the way that this framework wor is working. And um, uh, the intent is uh, to extend the comp components for different functionality, obviously right, there, right now for the rocket. 
uh, be able to extend those with some of the spacecraft that we're uh, working on right now. So. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to start getting into the, the Q&A uh, questions. The first one is from uh, Johan. Uh, I've been looking into F prime and CFS, and I was wondering what would be the criteria to go uh, one or the other on a project. Why would an F prime developer go for CFS and why would a CFS developer go for F prime? I think that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, Jake and, and Tim. Well, I mean, uh, I think there's there's different architectural approaches. I I have to commend CFS because I think they're farther along in the maturity path probably than we are with wider adoption. So there's a bigger user base. And so there's a strong argument to be made that if your culture has, has embraced a certain architectural approach and you have an experience base with that, you have to think carefully before you just jump ship to another worldview on architectures. And I would think that the, the major differences I think between F prime and CFS is that F prime is really a point to point architecture. You connect uh, components together, think of it as a bunch of tinker toys with the rods that attach them, right? So you have this constellation of components that talk to each other and they can talk to each other directly or through message queues. And so, <clears throat> um, the difference in my view between that and CFS is CFS has the message bus. It's, a, it's, a, it's an abstraction where you have uh, subscribers and um, you have publishers and they don't necessarily have to be aware of each other. So there's a strength there in the fact that it's easily reconfigurable. You can add and remove, you know, a comp if you will, components or modules to the system. So it's a point to point architecture versus a publish subscribe architecture. And, um, as far as it goes for the point to point, I think in some ways it's easier to embed a point to point architecture like F prime. If you're going really deeply embedded like a micro, microcontroller with no RTOS that, or no file system because you can just string these components together. The helicopter, if you saw my talk yesterday had a TI microcontroller with no RTOS, no file system. And it just ended up being a string of components that were talking to each other and that worked very successfully for us. And we're able to use the same development tools, do the same unit testing infrastructure, the same coverage tools, all these different things. We're able to use the same approach for both the embedded, no real, no OS microcontroller, and then the Linux-based Snapdragon. So I think it's really an architectural trade-off. And we've decided, at least for, for the work we do at JPL, because we have these static systems, but eventually when you have a spacecraft, you know the hardware, you know the interactions. And so having a static, system where you have a set of components that are interconnected in a point-to-point -point, uh, architecture kind of matches how the hardware is set up. But if you're in an environment that where you're constantly moving and adding and removing hardware and adding and removing clients, um, CFS definitely has an advantage there. Jake? <laughs> you pretty much described it. Uh, that's... Uh... I, I agree yeah, with all that was said, and, and and it makes a lot of sense. It's CF, CFS is is kind of heavier, I think of it. You know, it 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 has a lot of uh, more capabilities for you know the dynamic uh, loading, unloading of apps, um, loading of tables, that sort of thing. And like you said, software bus, so things can come and go, and your system can can continue to operate. Or you know, you can change change modes. Um, and we do rely heavily on uh, operating system features and it's a lot easier to use with a file system. So that, that's the big difference. Yeah, it's the point to point, to point versus software bus. And like I said, we're heavier. If, if you don't need, you know, a lot of, a lot of dynamic uh, capabilities or, you know, a lot of the executive services that um, CFS provides or, you know, the rest of the framework, um, it's, it's, you know, if you have something that's more point to point and more static, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the trade. And I would, I would, you know, I want to defer to Jacob to answer this one, but I think one thing that when we, we, we spent a day with the Ames, forgive me if I forgot his name, he might even be in the audience. We spent a day with, we invited um, somebody from Ames down who's the Ames contact for CFS and had a long conversation with him about, you know, the internals and the architecture of CFS. And I think one thing that we saw that we, question the bit was, was um, the message bus is a, a central resource in a CFS deployment. 
So you have a number of different modules at possibly different levels of priority in the, in the system that are, that are trying to grab this resource to send a message to another module. And as a real-time programmer, having a central resource that was being vied for um, made me worry a little bit about real-time situations where you have a low priority, you know, low priority task that has the bus at least momentarily, and then a high priority task has to wait to get this, to get it to send the message. And I know that they're good engineers and they've optimized the way that critical section as much as they can, but there's still this point in the architecture where all these modules come together to contend for the message bus. And so, um, you know, I want to defer to Jacob. I don't want to say that that's fatal or anything, but it's just, a, it's a, it's a trade-off in the real-time space because when you have a messaging architecture where you have independent modules messaging each other, um, you don't have as much of a contention for a resource. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot of system engineering that goes into the scheduling and how you're communicating between systems. And it gets a lot more complicated when you go uh, symmetric multiprocessing also. So if you're going across cores, um, you know, if you're waiting on a message, you're definitely going to get slowed down. And there's, you know, that negotiation of, uh, of priority. Um, we are definitely thinking about, um, and one of the goals is to get in a, uh, an API for a, a direct message uh, concept that would get around that such that you could, you know, there's nothing in there now that prevents you from directly communicating between apps, but um, we wanted to, to provide an API that would, would kind of give you that option also if you do want to avoid kind of the common bus, um, bus challenges. Um, but it is, yeah, it's more system engineering when you have to control and make sure your priorities are right, right and, you know, the high priority things aren't getting slowed down. Um, thank you. Uh, we're we're going to move on to Peter Fiddleman's question, and I'm going to throw this to Kevin and Christoph. Uh, what is the most useful constraint imposed by your framework and the most useless constraint? At least I can answer for the most useful constraint. Most useful constraint is probably uh, that you must be able to, to model uh, your system and then your software. As soon as you have this model, we have a, a tool chain that is able to integrate any kind of uh, component uh, you have described. So it is also linked to, to the following question, uh, meaning that we can uh, integrate the components that are developed in C, C++. We have bridge with uh, MATLAB Simulink, uh, and now also with uh, VHDL, where we are able to integrate all these components in, that are described in model and create the interfaces to interconnect them and to produce a final binary for both the uh, processor, but also for the FPGA. And for the useless constraints, what should I answer to that? <laughs> None. Perfect system. Um, Kevin? Yeah. Um, most, I think the most useful is um, new functionality uh, that we would be adding has to uh, reside in its own virtual memory space and have clean agnostic logical interfaces. Um, I'll just give an example uh, back to the GNC because most people heard that presentation. The TVC commands and thruster commands that uh, GNC is sending uh, to control the vehicle are actually logical commands. We could change the physical TVCs. They are, they are converted by another application into physical commands. So um, that's sort of, um, isolated and uh, generic interface um, that also allows us, by the way, and I forgot to mention this, we, we do have the ability to spawn multiple instances of the same thing. So we could have three instances of GNC running and doing a voting mechanism and also distribute that very simply with configuration changes, no source code changes. Um, so I think that's the, the best feature of the framework in, in general. Um, I'm going to go uh, uh, Christopher's route here and say that I can't think of a single horrible thing about the framework right now. I'm being honest. <laughs> Excellent. Um, from Zachary, uh, Caitlin, 
how uh, how are the teams behind these frameworks thinking about interoper in interoperability between C, C++ languages and Ada, Spark, Rust, and I'll throw in Python as well. Um, so are there are there movements to to include other languages or is C, C++ the uh, answer for for your framework? Um, and I think I'll, I'll just open that up to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll open that up. So I'd like to try and take a crack at that. I think um, this, uh, this question really points to language bindings for, uh, and, and also points to uh, tool support. So what, what, you know, what cross compilers do you have? And can you create language bindings and, uh, and and hook into your API um, using something you know like Ada Ada Spark or or or, or Rust. And and I think that for the the use case here is if you had a safety critical um, application that that you wanted to verify, and you, and then you wanted that a safety critical application to interact with your framework in some way, how would you do that? And um, I think what it really points to is the, the need or the requirement for some kind of language bindings to, you know, to enable uh, communication with us, uh, Ada Spark applications or, or, or applications compiled in Rust. Um, so that, that's what I would say. I think that that's really the, the need because you might have the, the need for, uh, an application that you can verify and perform some some kind of safety critical function, and that's really the 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 strength of Ada Spark and Rust. They provide a lot of that rigor that you would want. I think uh, I I'd love to pick up on that if that's okay. Um, so we we don't currently work with Ada Spark and Rust, but I I think a lot of uh, what's just been said is uh, it applies absolutely to the way that we are looking at things and because we're looking at applying the same framework technology um, and the same view of the system across both flight and ground then there are many different trade-offs that need to be made for different parts of that um, to safety critical and non-safety critical parts of the system and uh, there are big differences between the places where we have language bindings to um, to be able to to apply the same framework principles in, say, Java on the ground, um, and then to see in flight. And uh, the aim, as we're seeing, is is to be able to accommodate kind of more dynamism in various parts of the system. And we're we're kind of looking at doing that through the incorporation of languages like Python. Um, so I think it's about trying to find the right language for the right situation and finding a way to get these things to play nice um, in a uniform way through the framework so that we're following the same architectural principles wherever, wherever in the system we are. Yeah, for CFS, um, we provide the external code interface that's a, you know, kind of an app or a library interface to same thing, sort of the, the language bindings. And, and um, I know in the past uh, workshops, we've, we've seen some people uh, working with Rust with CFS, which is really neat. Um, not aware of much uh, recent Ada work, but I'm sure um, you know, I've worked with uh, mixing the code in the past uh, for Ada uh, two decades ago. Um, but uh, for, the, for the Python and Python bindings, some of the interesting stuff going on is, um, the EDS uh, work, electronic data sheet work. Um, some people have uh, started, uh, you know, working those concepts uh, with CFS and having some of that um, support in there. So one thing that uh, one of the members of our team is working at for F prime is to, to kind of swig wrap a lot of the, the component initialization interconnection code that we have in F prime so that you could have uh, you could have the the topology construction code, if you will, be run as a as actually a Python script. So if you're in a Linux environment where you have obviously it didn't work wouldn't work very well in embedded, but if you're in a more of a Linuxy environment, you could run Python to stitch all these components together and start them executing. But still early days, 
the other thing I would say is that the, the messaging methodology that F prime uses to go from component to component, it's a very, uh, it's a very standard way of marshalling or serializing data in a message. And so it wouldn't be that difficult for somebody to take another implementation language and essentially pack the data in the same format that F prime uses to kind of interconnect with an F prime deployment. And we have this pattern we call the hub pattern where you can cross CPU boundaries where you invoke component A can invoke component B on a completely different node just by going through one of these hubs and the hubs basically uh, serialize up the data in a known way so that you could have a hub in a different language deserialize it. Now that's not there out of the box, it's notionally there, but part of the advantage that we have of F prime in the C and C++ world is that we have all this tooling that does auto code generation for you know, component based classes and for unit test code and uh, ground system dictionaries and all that. And that doesn't exist for other languages yet, but there's always a potential you could do that and have um, interactions between F prime deployments in different languages. Any other takers on that? We're, we're not that far yet. We're all C++ right now. <laughs> so kudos to you, you other guys. Um, okay, uh, so question about F prime. I'm curious, uh, this is from Alan Cupmore. I'm, I'm curious if F prime is being considered for bigger missions at JPL instead of the flight co uh, software core product line. Um, and how, how do you handle overlap and, uh, and how do they complement each other? Um, I think that's a good question. There's nothing inherently limiting about F prime. You couldn't do a flagship mission, but at least the JPL, the flagship missions tend to have a paired set of hardware and software that go together. And there's a long history of development on that set of hardware. And so part of what can, constitutes the, the flight software core uh, at, at JPL is it's very much paired with hardware that complements it. And so they move this many times from flagship mission to flagship mission. And they have a highly developed set of this software that travels with it. Because the current like Psyche and Clipper, their software has its origins all the way back to, in essence, MSL and MSL uh, code itself. So there's a lot of, there's an inheritance path that when you have these big flagships with all this established hardware, it's kind of it's it's hard to break into that space, if you will, because there's an established history of more of a clone and own path as opposed to a, a framework that gets inherited. Um, but we have our, we have run on the same flight hardware that they do in some other projects that we've done at JPL. We've run on a Rad 750, and and uh, so we we know we can run in that environment. But again, it's the, it's the case of what suitability. What's the most suitable for a particular project to reduce the risk by the highest amount? Because class B is highly risk averse. So they're more prone to go with inherited hardware and inherited software as a pair. But at the same time, you know, F prime is building a good resume within JPL and helicopters help a lot in that. We've had very, very few software bugs running on the helicopter and the software has been very robust over the course of the project. So we're building, you know, we, like I said, we are building a resume. There's no reason why we can't do class B projects in the future, but it's really a matter of the project management deciding what path provides the least risk for them, the most likelihood of success. And uh, we hope to be there someday, but right now that the space that we're competing in, we're, we're, we're delivering a lot of projects that are in these, if you will, lower echelons, but we hope to definitely do some class B in the future. I can actually get Christoph to, to weigh in on how ESA chooses the flight software for, for the, the projects, whether it's like, is there generally a, a high tier and a low tier or uh, how all of that works? Yes, uh, actually ESA uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, is not, uh, uh, yeah. enforcing the use of any software and it is responsibility of the supplier. So first level supplier that is a, uh, usually a large scale integrator, uh, big company that is later uh, subcontracting uh, the production of the software. 
and uh, this is the responsibility of the industry to select the software to be used. So what uh, we are doing is more uh, relying on generic specifications that have been uh, approved by industry to ensure, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of uh, interoperability of the software and the execution platforms. So we do not, uh, uh, let's say, develop flight software, but we, su we are supporting the development of building blocks that are integrated in the execution platform that can be used by the European industry. Thank you so much. Um, uh, a question from Ingolf Steinbach. Uh, to anyone who wants to answer, how do you handle evolution of your framework? And who specifies that roadmap? Um, who may propose changes? And I think that this is going to be a, a very interesting take on uh, essentially a, a company specific one versus an open source one. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to hear. Uh... I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. I think from Firefly being a new space company, that would really be driven by, um, first of all, how successful is the, the software? And, and again, we'll just talk about Alpha right now without having any errors. Obviously, how easy is it for us to add new functionality? And that's already proven out. We added a major component um, after flight one, uh, done in pretty short order uh, into the framework using its current um, uh, interfaces and whatnot. I, I think the programs that Firefly does, like some of these uh, spacecraft and whatnot, will, will drive how the, the framework evolves besides obviously being, um, customizable and, and uh, easily configurable and extendable. So that's my thoughts from Firefly. From a CFS perspective, um, we have a lot, of, a lot of stakeholders and a lot of history, so it's a little bit hard to move. <laughs> um, but what we do is, is kind of these development cycles and, and major minor releases, you know, I'm sure like a lot of the other people do. And the, the, major releases you know we, we manage what we, what we can break or not um kind of thing versus uh keeping alive some of the some of the older uh versions and you know there's people still flying six five from i don't know what that is a decade ago um so it's it is hard to uh there's a lot of inertia with cfs um so we are constantly conscious of okay is this going to break break something, can we make it backwards compatible? Um, if we can do that, there's kind of an easy path to, to progress and then the next major release will end up deprecating typically. Um, but really we're, we're open to suggestions from anyone. Uh, we're, we're, you know, it's open source, uh, it's on GitHub. Anybody can submit, submit issues and we see all of them. Uh, we're not necessarily gonna in, implement all of them. And uh, a lot of times we encourage people to use the mechanisms for adaptability and configuration uh, changing the configuration uh, such that the, it doesn't break everything else. Um, one of the big things, I think it was in Puote's, or maybe it was Talem, where we really instituted sort of a more module perspective on the framework where you can actually take out, you know, say table services and you can put your own one in. As long as you match the API, things will, will work, but you can, you can replace the techniques used under the hood um, we did that with the, the message, uh, message handling and how the message IDs work very successfully. Uh, multiple teams are using different now definitions for how that works under the hood, but every other app doesn't, doesn't really care as long as you're using the generic types and the generic APIs. Um, so that's where we're going in the future is trying to make it easier for people to customize things, which also makes it easier for us to upgrade or to change how things work because we can in parallel still maintain, as long as they're meeting the API, we can still maintain the old technique and the new technique and people can trade them and pick whichever pieces they want. Yeah, and I would kind of echo that same pattern for F prime is that we do, it is open source on GitHub and we have a team at JPL that kind of manages the releases. And, uh, but what we found is over the years is that as we've had projects adopt F prime and use them, They've come up with useful 
uh, components on themselves and we feed them back in. So we have this, this uh, process over the years where you know, we're feeding new stuff in. And we have this core set of components that we guard very carefully, the ones that really related to C and DH, like command, telemetry handling, that sort of thing. But there's also <clears throat> other components that uh, are kind of cool ones that we have in another repo. So there's the core F prime repo on GitHub, but then we have this area called, this other organization called F prime community. And that's sort of a place where people are posting like, hey, this component was kind of cool. It's not really a core function, but it might help you out. And we're posting things like uh, CMake platform files and toolchain files for platforms where people have ported to, like maybe FreeRTOS on one platform or cross compiling for this other microcontroller. And so there's these two aspects where we're like, you know, here's the core F prime that we go through a very methodical release cycle of testing and and uh, you know reviews and everything. We do have a pull request model that's GitHub. So we do accept pull requests from outside people in the core repo. They're just much more carefully looked at. And we've actually had a number of people, especially since Helicopter got the visibility it did, there was a big flurry around GitHub. Some of you may have seen the badges that went out for the Helicopter project where you know GitHub got excited and they, they traced back through, especially our ground tools, back to all the individual developers in the open source community, gave them a little helicopter badge if they had Something you know that would like like right, right justify a string or whatever, but somehow it made it up into our ground tools. They got a little helicopter badge, and so that got a lot of open source people excited about it. But you know we've had people from outside JPL who have contributed bug fixes and and things back into the core repo, and we've reviewed them and accepted them. But we do follow. So I would say it's probably you could call it like semi methodical. You know, obviously Jacob and his crew. You know they have a lot of customers they have to be much more careful um we do too but we also have this other forum this f prime community where people can contribute other things that they just don't have a warranty sticker but they may be useful for your project and uh so in, in essence to answer the question anybody can propose fixes and updates through a pull request method through the core repo, but they can also contrib contribute to this other repository if, if they find something that's handy that's worked for them. We have, we have three minutes left, but I really want to hear from Amalaya and, and Peter on this one as well. Yeah, I, I'm going to answer uh, pretty quickly. So as, as Tim shared, I was uh, the first guinea pig on F prime. And a couple of the things that he mentioned uh, really are, are the answer to, I think are the answer to this question. I think for one community engagement. So I remember going to Tim as you know the user of F Prime and saying, hey, I, you know, this feature would be really good. And and Tim would would implement the feature. So I, I think the the way I look at the question is how would you how do you mature your framework? How do you uh, make it more robust? And I think community engagement uh, is is the way to do it. I think it really points to how do you manage pull requests from the community, and that's that's a bit tricky. But I think that you can uh, have a process or procedure for handling that. So, and and uh, F, working on F prime was a lot of fun. So, I think I'd like to pick up on just one part of that um, very quickly to wrap up. I guess is is uh, the bit about handling evolution of the framework. And I think perhaps what's interesting about what we're increasingly trying to do with generation one is to um, is to manage evolution of the framework in, in the model. Um, and so because our model captures service definitions as part of it, which are effectively part of the effectively the API is that link everything together, we can manage the evolution of those over time. And so we can capture in the model, not just the service definitions now, but what they maybe used to be. Um, and that really helps with, with being able to work with long running kind of systems or long running development processes. Um, and so that's in its early days now, but it's kind of bitter experience of, of having to manage framework evolution that's led us down that path of trying to leverage the stuff that we've got and in our case that includes taking a model-based approach um i'm i'm sorry to say that that is all the time we have these hours seem to go really really fast uh we're going to continue the conversation on slack uh so there is a town hall frameworks slack channel um and i would invite people uh i'll pull the questions over and 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 make sure that they're they're updated there but uh 
invite people to engage. I think that this has been really helpful. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been great.